let us begin. So welcome um, to the latest installment of the uh, Outback uh, Summer Series of Webinars. I was going to say which number this was, but I don't really know. Um, but it's the latest. I can say that much in confidence. And, um, and the topic of discussion is going to be on the Outback Power Sizing Spreadsheet. I'll tell you a little bit of history about where it came from um, and some specifics about things. But um, my name, and I'll be the one presenting today, I'm, my name is Roy Dingen. Um, I'm an application engineer here at Outback, and I also teach, actually my, my, actually my primary function here, is to teach what we call our certificate training program. It's a four-day, full four-day um, training um, uh, program that uh, has, I think, 26 CEU credits for NAPSEP, and so if you're interested in that, um, you know, you can find out about it on our website or email training. Um, but the reason I mention the training is because I want to be sure to, that we all understand that we're not going to be coming into a, uh, a one-hour webinar and learn everything there is to know about you know, um, off-grid solutions or battery-based solutions or even just sizing. So I'm going to do the best I can to cover what we can in an hour. But the main focus really is going to be on this particular spreadsheet that we use for training. So, with that, I, I really like to make clear who I, um, you know, I, I, I try to be speaking to. And in reality, this is intended for an experienced um, installer audience. Now, that doesn't mean if you're not that you should hang up and get off the phone. Um, if you're a homeowner, there'll be a lot here for you to benefit from using the spreadsheet. And, um, but I guess the thing is, it's just, there are going to be things that I'm not going to cover. For instance, when we get into... Um, string sizing a little bit here. We're not going to go in depth on the, you know, the, the solar, the radiance, and all this. We're going to be basically covering it from the, in terms of how this spreadsheet happens to work. So it also there's some there's some parts of it that actually assume some Outback product knowledge. Um, this, you know, be clear, this is an Outback product, and it's um, you know, it's to help you choose Outback equipment. So. Uh, there is there is a section in it you'll, you'll see when I get there about you know entering in some data from um, Outback equipment to be able to select the right um, gear properly and I'll go over how that works. Um, so there is some assumption of either Outback product knowledge or the willingness to read spec sheets I guess so there will be a little bit of that. Um, this is, like I said, we're specifically covering this spreadsheet. We're not going to be doing an in-depth sizing review. Um, you know, I mean, I've seen courses that for sizing off-grid systems that last over a week. And I teach in the CTP. I do sizing throughout the week um, pretty, pretty thoroughly. Um, but here we have one hour, and like, again, the focus is the spreadsheet itself. I'm going to hold the questions to the end, which is totally unlike me, um, but uh, it helps to get through it, um, and then we'll we'll um, we'll we'll take whatever time we have left. We have one hour, and I can even go over if we do um, to answer the questions at the end. But I'd like to keep them spreadsheet specific. Um, I don't want to go into things like I have a house that's 3,300 square feet. What do I need? Or or even you know let's go into lithium batteries or anything like that. We really want to keep this topic. Um, focused, and the topic is again the spreadsheet. So, before we get to the spreadsheet itself, I only have about four slides here, um, five or maybe five, twelve. Um, oh, that's because of some graphics. Um, but we're going to answer hopefully three questions. Is the, is the idea here? Number one, I think, is important. It's almost to me maybe the most important in, in, to, in some degree is the answer why do we size a system? Um, I could spend hours telling you horror stories of customers that didn't size a system properly and then um, wanted to know why the system didn't operate as, 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 with their, with their, up to their expectations. So we're going to talk about a little bit about that. And once we've decided that, okay, yes, we do have to size the system, well, there are components within the system. Briefly, we'll talk about what those components are and how we'll size them and the differences um, and how they size. And then finally, which we'll spend the bulk of it on, of course, is how. And there's different methods of how, 
and we're going to focus on the one, which is um, the spreadsheet in general. So, little history on where the spreadsheet came from. Um, I, as an app engineer, there's, and I'm not the only app engineer, there's actually a team of four of us here at Outback, and, and everywhere I've actually worked um, has been the same. There's been a number of app engineers, and we've always typically had our own spreadsheets, just a little spreadsheet that calculates some loads out and maybe do some string sizing, different things. Well, the request came to our department to, to come together and bring those spreadsheets into one and, um, you know, use the strengths of all of them and, and then get it sort of, um, you know, basically company approved. And that's what I'm going to be showing you here and how to get it. And I mean, it's, it's free for, well, we don't have it on the website, right? I will get to how you'll get it. You'll, you can get it on today, but um, right now it's not on the website. Another thing to note is that being um, this type of spreadsheet, there are, uh, you'll notice when you get it, I think we're on revision S, which means we've been through quite a few revisions. And I'm going to guess we'll have a few more. So um, there are going to be things that we'll make better. There are going to be mistakes that get found. And so um, that's where we stand with it. But it works pretty darn good, if I might say so. So again, why do we size? What do we size? How do we size, right? So why do we size? One of the things that I've run into over the years most frequently in terms of problem systems has been the lack of the customer, the installer, whoever the system designer is, to actually quantify in some fashion what the loads were. Um, we need to. It has to be done. This is not optional. I, I've seen people, I mean, after doing a week-long course, will come back to me and say, hey, I've got this system but I don't know what the loads are. What can you help me with? And my answer is, unfortunately, nothing. You have to quantify loads somehow. Um, and we need to do it in a different way and with some additions to what you would do if you're, from, you know, if, you're, if you're familiar with grid tie. And there's a big difference in sizing a battery-based system from a grid tie system. And the big difference is that we have to actually power the loads. A grid tie inverter, batteryless, doesn't actually power loads. So when you size a grid tie system, you look at things like roof space, kilowatt hour usage, um, power rates, and things like that. It's pretty much a fiscal, fiscal decision in a lot of cases. When it comes to running a, or designing a battery-based system, we also have to take into account power. And we need to really be sure we have a good distinction, an understanding of the distinction between power and energy. Power is instantaneously, instantaneous. It's measured in kilowatts, or KVA. And energy is measured in kilowatt hours. It's basically, it's power over time. When you get your power bill, it should actually be called your energy bill. Um, because it's your build on kilowatt hours. Um, and that is useful in designing, actually very useful in designing an off-grid system or a battery-based system in general, but it's also necessary to do power, and we'll talk about that. So, quantifying the loads, how do we do it? There's three ways. First, and the best, would be to measure. And if you've got an existing home, cabin, commercial site, whatever it is, telecom site, whatever you have, if you're up and running with power, be it from a generator or from grid or what have you, you can measure. And you can measure, you can get the peak peak demand so you can get our power, you can get your kilowatt hour usage daily so you can get your energy, and we can do this pretty straightforward. But quite often we don't have that luxury. And that reason is, is because we're talking about something that's new construction. When we have new construction, since we can't do the best, which is measure, we, the next best down is going to be to calculate. And that is used, like I said, primarily for, use, for new construction, and it involves basically doing the very best you can to list all of the loads and how long they will be running. And be aware that if you're incorrect here, everything else is going to be incorrect as well. So the input on how much loads we use is going to be pretty important to the success of this system. Um, another note is that end users, we kind of jokingly say around the phones, end users will always add loads after the fact. So, um, Calculating is important, and it's something that should be done on-site in an interview with your customer at the place that it's going to be, if possible. 
If not, sit down in front of the house plants, for instance. The third and the most frequently used method, unfortunately, is a guess. And I see this quite often, um, where just they, they, I, they will com call to complain about the system not operating properly. I ask them how much the kilowatt hour usage is, and they say, I don't know. And I ask how they design the system, and they would say something like, well, doesn't it seem like enough? Well, no, the answer is no, it doesn't. That's the problem. So while some installers out there, I know a few that are very, very experienced off-grid installers, they can walk into a house, meet the family, look at the house, and come up with a pretty darn good guess. It takes a long time to develop that sixth sense, if you will. For the rest of us, the guessing method, and that's not even a guess, that's actually experience, um, uh, you know, an, an analysis, um, just not on paper. What we're going to be concentrating on is the calculation method. And something else to throw out there, which, you know, it, it should be common knowledge, but unfortunately it's not, square footage has no relevance to energy. If you call up and you say, how much system do I need for a 3,200 square foot home? I unfortunately am not going to be able to help you with that. It's not, there's no direct relationship. And I, you know, half-heartedly say, or not half-heartedly, but half, uh, half jokingly say, it is helpful for carpeting and paint, but it's not helpful for anything to do with electrical or solar or batteries or anything. So kind of just get that out of your head. We need to deal with loads. So back up to the first point, we need to quantify loads. Now, if you go as far as designing and implementing a, uh, you know, a system based on a guess, there are no settings in the MATE 3 that can overcome a poorly designed system. So if you have a system that's insufficient and you call tech support to ask for help to make some settings to make it work better, it's not, there's no setting that can make your battery bank larger or your array larger or your inverter large enough to handle that big pump load. So be aware of all this. So this is back to the idea of why do we, why do we do this? So we're going to focus on method two, calculating. We're not going to work with guessing. We're not going to work with measuring today. And here is what one method of guessing is. I was at a training at one point in time years ago where there was a group of electricians, standard home residential electricians in the group. And I started talking about sizing systems and I went over the spreadsheets that we had at the time and entering in the loads and calculating how much time they were going to be on. And one of the electricians in the back of the room rose his hand and said, I, I ain't doing it that way. You don't understand. We have a table. If I got a 20, if I got a 2,500 square foot home, I need to put in a 200 amp load center. So can you just give me a parts list for a 200 amp load center? So we did the math for, for him. All, and, and all together we did this math. And here's what I came up with. If you have a 200 amp load center, it's capable of delivering 48,000 watts because it's 240 at a residential level, right? This would be six Radian GS8048 inverters. The inverters are rated in KVA, and so we have eight KVA per inverter. You want to get the 48,000 watts to replace that 200 amp load center. That's what you need. Unfortunately, that's not the worst part of this whole formula. The energy is going to be worse. Remember now, power and energy. I'll reiterate that. Power is instantaneous, and that's how we size our inverter. Energy, 48 kilowatts over a 24-hour time period. That little electrical panel in the closet in your bedroom can deliver 48 kW 24 hours a day, resulting in 1,152,000 watt hours per day or 1.152 megawatt hours per day. Quite a bit more than the average home. Quite a bit more than 10 of the average homes. And if you do the math on that, which we're not going to do for you today, but it will result in close to a half a megawatt of solar and 12 of our 80 amp charge controllers. You can see this is getting out of hand, but the battery bank's almost the worst part. The battery bank with 48,000 amp hours would be required for one day of autonomy at a 50% depth of discharge. And that equates to 120,000 pounds of batteries. So if you decide that you want to just replace a 200 amp load center, here's your parts list. Um, 
not the way to do it. And this is the thing, from an electrician standpoint, if I decide between a 100 amp service and a 200 amp service, very little difference in cost. You're pulling a little bigger wire and putting it in a different load center. When it comes to solar, those two things are vastly different. So we really do want to calculate. That's the point I'm trying to make, is that there's not a good shortcut here. If there was such thing as an average home, I can guarantee the one you're working with isn't average. So when we do size, what do we have to size? Well, first off, remember now, we're, I, again, I'll say it, I'll say it probably too many times. We need to deal with kilowatts and kilowatt hours or power and energy. And different things or items within the system are going to be sized with power and some with energy. And those things, I'm going to start with the inverter. For the most part, for the most part, and I would say 99%, there's some crossover here and there, but you're sizing the inverter for power. How much are the loads you're trying to run? And when we're talking about a battery-based system, now for you grid type people out there, there's more to it than just how big is the array. The array has no bearing on the size of the inverter in an off-grid system. It has some bearing in a grid tie system. I'm actually going to get to that later when we get to some results on the, on the calculator. But for now, inverter is sized for power. Charge controller. Um, the charge controller sits between this PV array and the batteries. And it is sized on the size of the array. So that's going to be power. Solar array. Well, that's not sized on power. That's making energy. So we're going to be sizing that on energy. It has kilowatt hours, right? And the batteries, again, energy. So these, in a battery-based system, these are the primary components that we're sizing. There's also wire sizing, there's um, breaker sizing, there's lots of other sizing issues. But for the most part, we're not going to talk about that at all, not for the most part. We are not going to talk about that at all today. We're talking about sizing these components. So, a few disclaimers here. Any spreadsheet, sizing tool, um, or anything of the sort that you'll see from any manufacturer will have disclaimers. Um, and they are potentially have errors in them. And they do not replace a qualified person on the site with knowledge of what they are doing. And so it, it comes down to this too. When you, who does the sizing of the system? And the answer to that question is the system designer. Now, who is the system designer? Well, first off, I can tell you who it's not. It's not Outback Power. It's not our tech support. Um, it may or may not be a distributor who buys equipment from us. Probably not. It most likely and should be the installer. And the installer needs to know how to do sizing and I'm giving them a tool right now to do that. But the responsibility for sizing the system is on their shoulders. That's what they've taken on. Now, if you're a homeowner and you're doing the system yourself, uh, then you are taking on the role of designer. So it is your responsibility. And there's lots of good information out there. I'm not going to say it can't be done. But that is not, and I'm going to kind of repeat this, not the role of say a tech support for an inverter manufacturer. It's not the role of even a distributor. If you buy your equipment online and um, you buy it off of Amazon, it's not Amazon's responsibility to help size your system. So I just want to make that clear. When you do size it as a designer, you need to do the very best you can. And what I mean by that is all the data that we're going to enter. The, um, the, the, uh, the load section um, needs to be as accurate as you can make it. You should sit down with your customer, go over their house plans, go room by room, do the very best you can, and make sure that they understand that what you're doing is only as good as the information that they give you. Because if they lie about a load to try to make their system smaller and more affordable, it's not going to operate as they expect it to. So you want to make sure you get everything. And with that, I would also, in a contract that you have with them, or with yourself, would be to quantify and, and, and document how much you are designing this system 
to work with. For instance, if you design a system based on 10 kilowatt hours a day, and you come back a year later and the customer is complaining because it's not operating and they're using 24, cover yourself. Make a document. Include a copy of the spreadsheet, the, the, the results of the spreadsheet, and um, signed off by them. Um, or if you're doing it yourself, understand that when you're using more, you just need to add to the system. You don't need to complain. So with that, this spreadsheet in, in particular is a tool, a tool to have in your tool belt for doing sizing. It is not the end-all, be-all. It would be nice if we could just enter in your address and your square footage and come out with a full list of materials and all the set points that you need. I don't think that, that will ever happen in this industry, um, although I've been wrong before. Um, but this is a tool, and use it with, with discretion and use it with skepticism. Don't always trust everything. Double check all math, particularly on, on, on an important bid. Um, because one little mistake that you make could end up costing you money. Oop. So with that, we're going to open the spreadsheet and we're going to go into how to enter all of our data in here. So first an overview. We have basically along the bottom, we see some tabs here. We've got the user inputs. I hope that's self-explanatory. We have the system summary. That's going to give us a summary of everything that we um, are going to need and, and what we are using based on our inputs. Then we have a, t a quick chart for North American sun hours. This is kind of a little add-on here. Um, you can use your own data. If you have better data, please use it. Um, and you'll see here, and the question came up last presentation, I have summer, winter, and year-round average. And the question is, which one should you use? I'm going to leave that to you. Typically, I would, in an off-grid system myself, though this is an opinion, not a recommendation, I would use average and use a generator. If you want a size for less generator runtime, use winter. Um, if you're a summer-only cabin, use summer. But I won't get into the, like I said, the specifics of sizing, just how to use a spreadsheet. Just know that you can change that number. Typical load watts is another one, which is a table of some typical kind of load watts that you can find on the Internet anywhere. Now, what's better than doing this is actually using your specifics. As an example, if you have a refrigerator, find out what it draws. Hook it up to a little, you know, a, 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 a um, kilowatt meter. Um, read, the, read the current draw. Find out what it actually does draw and use those numbers instead of these that we provide you with. These are handy if you don't have anything. Just continue to do a first, first run at it. But if you can, use your own numbers. The last is going to be a database that you build yourself. So some of these spreadsheets and tools, um, and generally speaking, because of the fact that they have built-in databases, and that's what I was going to get into, they have, they have databases of modules. The, the idea of having a database um, and, and a sizing tool has its drawbacks. Number one, you got to always check for updates um, because modules keep adding. Um, people you come out with new modules. You know they change the specs in their modules. And so, um, so somebody has to maintain that database and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and it gets very unwieldy. The way we're doing it here is you can just enter in the important specifications for our sizing exercise here. Um, into here, you can get rid of these and put your own in and just have a database of your own modules and then simply cut and paste the specifics for that module what you want to use. Eventually we'd like to make it so it's a drop down box and you select from your from your database but that'll be potentially one of the newer revs. Again you see right here where we are right now on revision S. So, so that's across the, the tabs. Now if we look at the first page where we're going to start with is this is the user inputs. From the user input standpoint there are three sections. Section one are the loads AC and DC. Section two is some required system details. Section three is optional equipment specifications, which will help, you'll see the results of that. If all I do is fill out section one, the only data I'm gonna get is right here. Total continuous KVA, total surge, total DC watts, total kilowatt hours. Not unuseful. Um, you can take that number and go use it for whatever, um, but we're gonna try to take it a step further. Now, if you don't fill in section one, you have nothing. Um, 
In a past life, I worked with another spreadsheet that was actually was a very expensive um, sizing tool that was sold. And, um, and people came back mad because they found that they had to enter the loads in. There's no way to do this without loads. Section 1 is required. We'll go over how to enter the loads in. If you, see, if you do fill out sections 1 and 2, where it says required here, then in the system summary, you'll actually get some data. And that data you'll get is this top box, which is the minimum system size. It will not give you, without filling out the third section, the lower section, which is going to be specifics on your equipment, outback equipment. So we'll get to all of those. So first off, when we go to the to the um, load profile section, you can see we actually have AC and DC loads that we've separated out. And the reason for that is, well, the inverter needs to run the DC loads, so we're going to need that for power. But the array is going to need the power to DC loads, so we're, so we're going to need energy for those. So we're going to separate those out. So fairly straightforward, I think, and these spreadsheets are fairly common. You may have worked with others before. We're going to enter in the load that we're speaking of, all the different loads. You're going to enter in how many of those loads are in the system, how many watts they are per load, how many days a, hours of day you expect that load to run, how many days per week you want that load to run, and this one will take a little bit of explaining, a surge multiplier. So what we're doing here is if you have a load, for instance, a refrigerator or a freezer are great examples that do surge and you don't know the exact number. We're talking about typical household loads now. Refrigerator, freezer, dishwasher, um, trash compactor, these types of loads. What we recommend is that you use a multiplier of three. Lo loads like ah, coffee maker is, is pretty, not much surge. Make it one. Now, if you have loads that are very large, for instance, pumps, if you've got pumps, you want to be very specific about the surge multiplier and not just use that three. So again, typical household loads, use three. Things like bigger motors, compressors, uh, well pumps, find the actual number. The more accurate you make this, the better it's going to be. So you put in the surge multiplier, and that's going to go to power, right? But remember, we're looking for power for how big our inverter stack needs to be. So there's your AC loads. Now, one of the things that is sort of misstated most of the time by most of us, including myself, is how many watts is that um, inverter. And our inverters, for instance, our 8K radian is actually 8 kVA, not 8,000 watts. So since inverters are rated in kVA, you really need to know what the kVA of your loads are. I'm not going to go into this, we're not going to do a lesson on power factor here, but, su but suffice it to say, if you leave the power factor at 0.8 for your whole house, which is what this box here does, you're pretty good. And what you're doing is you're padding up the size of the inverter a little bit to account for the for power factor. Um, you can change that if you have strong feelings on your loads. Um, I personally would not recommend changing it unless you have, unless you're changing it down. <laughs> Uh, to make it worse, if you, if you know you've got some bad loads, but all these loads up here are going to have some power factor issues. So point eight will give you that padding that you need. DC loads. Um, we've, we might think that there are no DC loads out there, but the truth of the matter is that there are. And one of them is the inverter. The inverter draws some energy off the DC just to stay alive. And so this is a number you're going to get off the spec sheet. So you may end up kind of going back and forth on this. I don't think the, the tear loss of an inverter is not going to affect your output. So um, go into it with what you think you might be using, or just use this def default here for the time being, and you may end up, depending on your, uh, your inverter selection at the end, you may change that um, because that's a number you'll find on the spec sheet. But if you also have DC loads, um, for instance, you may have some DC lighting or um, I, know, I think there's some DC electric fences I've worked with or, or DC pump then you can enter those DC loads into here where it won't affect the inverter size, but it will affect everything else, right? So there's a section for DC and the same kind of thing, quantity, watts, hours per day. And we don't say amps because we're going to be later on down the road here. We're going to actually enter in our system voltage. So don't worry about that yet. 
So, section one, if you complete that, we get this box filled out. Nothing else on that, nothing on the system summary until we figure, fill out section two. So if we move on to section two, first off, um, all the temperatures that we're using are going to be Fahrenheit. We have over here a little conversion tool. It does not populate the boxes, but you can use it for going from um, Celsius to Fahrenheit if you choose, or from meters to feet if you're, if you're used to um, using you know, the uh, uh, metric units. Uh, but the, the, the boxes that we are using in the spreadsheet, they are Fahrenheit. So the first one is going to be our desired battery voltage. You're really going to have only three choices here, 12, 24, and 48. We have a drop-down box. Uh, there was in the past some 36 and 32 volt systems I see in mobile applications, but that's not the intention of this spreadsheet, so those are your three choices. If you're looking at which you should use, if we just say 48, you'll be fine. Uh, there are some 24 volt systems out there for some smaller stuff, even less 12 volt for really smaller stuff, so we leave that stuff here. Um, for instance, if you have um, you know small kind of industrial type of things or what have you. But for the most part, residential, you're going to be dealing with 48. So, on to the environment, and I'm going to explain what all these boxes do so you know why you're entering them. So the lowest expected PV operating temperature, now this is something if you've done string sizing before for, for grid tie, etc., it's pretty familiar to you, but if you haven't, it might not be. And what it is, is the minimum record daytime temperature. And the reason for that is modules, solar panels, get go higher voltage than their rating as they get colder than 25 degrees C. So we need to make sure that we're going to keep voltage under something, you know, depending on the equipment we're using. So we always have to have our, for sizing a solar array, the string size, in other words, how many are wired in series, we have to know the minimum daytime temperature. So that's where we're going to enter that. And that is, again, record daytime temperature low. If it goes beyond that too much, you could have higher voltage, which could damage the charge controller. So you want to be careful on that one. The next one, and again, oh, I didn't, not again, but that is ambient temperature. We'll account for, for other temperatures later. So ambient temperature, outdoor. Next one down, highest expected PV operating temperature. Again, ambient and Fahrenheit. And this one is less important, but important. And it's for derating because as the, as since the VOC of a panel goes up when it gets cold, well, it goes down and so does the VMP when it gets warm. So we want to make sure that the array that you're configuring is high enough to charge your battery voltage. And if you what you're going to put in here, you don't need to put in record high temperature. Matter of fact, what I would do is put in average. So for instance, as an example, I live in the northwest here in Washington State. I would put in 80 degrees for my own system. Now, the past few weeks, we've had some temperatures in the 90s. Uh, maybe not the past couple, well, the past few weeks. Um, which is kind of unseasonably warm. What's going to happen in those temperatures is I'm going to get lower performance out of the array because I'll be off the power point of the, of, the, uh, of the array. It won't damage anything, and it'll still charge, but it won't damage anything. That's the key. So use average high temperature. and record low temperature. Those are important. Next down, inverter operating temperature. Again, this is ambient, and inverters are all rated, battery-based inverters in particular, are all rated to a particular temperature. Ours are rated at 25 degrees C or 77 degrees Fahrenheit. For every degree C room temperature is above that, we derate by 1%. So when you put in your, if you're, if you're going to be in a room that's 104 degrees, we're going to derate fairly significantly. So we're going to, it's going to up the number of inverters required. So that's what that box is for. Next box down, it was actually blank. We're not going to be filling that one out. We actually eliminated that. And that was, we used to have, we, when we tried to implement a derate factor for altitude. And we came up with the fact that for as little it was used, the complexity of it, and we had some issues with that. So that's out for now in particular, but all the sizing calculations for now are based on elevations below 5,000 feet. If you're above 5,000 feet, we're going to need to look into that. Um, you can contact us, um, you know, talk to tech support, find out things, you know, ask them. 
Uh, it, it might get escalated to app engineering depending on the, the level of it or get on the internet and find out how to do how much did you rate for temperature for altitude but for now this spreadsheet does not account for that so is the PV array installed on a roof the answer here is either a yes or a no basically what it, it would to me would be clear would be to say is this roof mount or rack mount and it's all about cooling or not cooling but less heating and so what we're doing is it's changing how much temperature we are adding to the ambient on the solar array. So if you're mounted on the roof, you get less airflow. If you're mounted on a rack, uh, pole mount and such, you get, you get more airflow. So you can use that at your discretion. Is the project exposed to dirt, dust, marine environments? That's to help you if you're selecting an FX series inverter. That'll help you to select um, the sealed unit over the vented unit. I won't go too deep into that not too complicated things like now here's back to that we're at um, daily peak sun hours again I put in here for myself in the Northwest 3.77 and that's our average doing an off-grid system is that what you would use or would you use uh, December's number of 1.2 or something um, it's up to you and it comes down to how you're going to design the system um, what's nice about the, a, a spreadsheet like this is you can try that and see what it's going to do to your array size and see if it's even feasible. So, um, you know, these numbers are meant to be messed with and played with after you put them in. Shading coefficient, this one is going to affect your array size. If I put 100%, that means I got no shade, and it's going to do some fairly simple math. If I've got shading, it's going to increase your array size. So use that accordingly. Charge controller efficiency. This one is going to be specific to your charge controller. If you're using one of ours, the MX or the F MX, I'm showing my age now, the FM60 or the um, FM80, then 97% um, is where it's at. So that's going to be your charge controller efficiency. So this is why I say you need to know your equipment a little bit to sometimes do some of these boxes as well. This one, this is the one that is sometimes maddening but it's the real world and that is just additional derating and this is stuff like uh, mismatch in the wiring um, module uh, module mismatch or wire losses um, uh, birds making making um, a mess <laughs> if you will on the on the array all these things add up to be um, inefficiency in our arrays and using 75% is a fairly widely accepted number. If you have a stronger feeling about it, feel free to change it. Where it sits right now is probably pretty accurate, though. So that's going to have an effect on our array size, of course. Battery to temperature, low temperature on those. You know, we're not asking for high temperature, and this is why. So low temperatures, when I say low, below 25 degrees C or 77 degrees Fahrenheit, will actually decrease the capacity of your battery. And since we are calculating capacity of the battery, we're going to want to know if it's cold in the battery room. Now, if it's warm in the battery room, it's not going to increase the, the capacity, but it is going to decrease the life. So we're not going to be talking about that because this spreadsheet is not going to calculate the life of your battery. So we're not interested in that. Um, but you should be aware of that. So we'll try to keep your batteries cool for their own benefit. Uh, then we're getting down to things that are kind of system design issues, days of autonomy. Now, when you ask a customer what the days of autonomy they want in their design, if they say 365, you know they don't understand the term. Days of autonomy is the number of days that that battery bank will operate without some input from solar or what have you. Now, the common ones, and this isn't to mean that they're the correct ones, but the common ones that I have seen used are potentially one for a battery backup system, two for an off-grid system, and potentially five for an off-grid system without a generator. I should clarify that. Two days for an off-grid system with a generator. Fairly common. Again, you may have other feelings on that, and um, I, I, I support all of those. So, so the day's autonomy is going to help us size the battery bank. Now this next one down, hours of ancillary operation. This one is for if you're doing things like um, uh, time of use where you have maybe you've got um, a period of the day you know say from five to eight in the afternoon where you get really high rate from a time of use um, situation you can use this to si help size your it'll, 
use that in the calculation sizing your battery bank. So um, I've never used it. I don't find it very useful for myself, um, but it's there if you want to use it for you know, peak shaving, time of use, avoidance, etc. Battery depth of discharge. This is another one that's going to be up to you, but um, the typical ones that people use are 50% for daily cycling maximum and 80% um, for um, battery backup type systems. Um, that doesn't mean these are correct. I would actually encourage you to research your battery, see how much it costs, see how many cycles you can get out of it at a particular depth of discharge and make that, make that decision accordingly. That's what I would but again, the rules of thumb people use are 50 for off-grid, 80 for grid-type battery backup. And I'm going to say right now that all this the example I'm doing is for an off-grid system. So I'm going to do 50% and two days of autonomy because I'm assuming also I'm going to use a generator. So that completes section two. So now if I complete sections one and two, now I can get something from our system summary. I can look here and I can say I need 3,000 amp hours at 48 volts based on all that. I can say that I'm going to need 6.42 kVA of inverter continuous output. I'm going to need 8.64 kVA of inverter surge capacity. I need 15.02 watts, kilowatts of PV array, which is going to be on the battery side, 313 amps for my charge controller sizing. So if I stop there and didn't fill out the next section, I'd still have some pretty useful information here that I could do some system sizing with. But we're going to take it another step further and we're going to fill out section three and get the bottom. So now that we have the required stuff, now I have the optional. But so now this is going to require a little bit more understanding of Outback equipment, or at least the willingness to read spec sheets, because you're going to be looking, you're going to be entering in data from an inverter model that you choose. And I'm not going to go into choosing inverter models today. Um, but we'll just, I'm going to be basically working with right now an, uh, a Radian GS8048A. So I have an inverter efficiency of 93%. That's off the spec sheet. I have an inverter continuous power of 8 kVA. I have a surge capacity of 100 millisecond of 16 kVA. And this one takes some clarification. On the spec sheet, if you look on the spec sheet, it'll say 16.97 kVA for a 100 millisecond surge, and that's what we're looking for. If you put in 16.97, it'll give you an error. So basically, if you're using Outback equipment, put in the nominal K, you know, the kVA rating of the inverter, use double for the surge, and you're correct. So if I do, if I do a 3.6 kVA inverter, I would put 7.2, etc. So just double that input. I can guess based on this that that's going to be changed in Rev T. So that and that's the end of the inverter spec or the inverter um, specifications. And again, if you don't know Outback inverters, where would you get that stuff? So it's not going to tell you what inverter to use. It's going to tell you how many of the inverter you select to use. So this is where you know, something like taking the CTP class, because we go into very specifically deciding on what inverter to use. So I won't be covering that today. So just be aware of that. So the next section down is the PV module. And this all comes from the PV spec sheet, of course. And we can just drag and drop it, not drag and drop, but cut and paste it from my PV data. So what I would do, if I was going to enter in a module, I would get the spec sheet for a particular module, and I would enter it in here. I wouldn't enter it straight into the spread spreadsheet because it'd be easier to add it later from here. And every time you enter it, there's one more chance of making a mistake. As a matter of fact, when doing this example, I forgot to put in the negative sign on the um, VTOC number, and it changed the math dramatically and kind of disturbingly. So make sure you get these numbers right. We'll go through what they all mean. So. PV, a PV module powered STC, how many watts is that solar panel, right? Standard test conditions, you know, 1,000 watts per square meter of irradiance, 25 degrees cell temperature, 1.5 thicknesses of atmosphere, all these other things that are on the spec sheet, right? So under standard test conditions, that's a 300-watt module. 
the PV module VMP or max power voltage. That's the, that's the voltage at which it produces the max power at standard test conditions. In this case here, 32.6, so that's what you would enter. Again, off the spec sheet, the VOC, or the open circuit voltage at the standard test conditions, is 40. So we would enter that in. These two numbers, I want to be really clear on how to enter them, because if you enter them wrong, you'll get bad information. So the line after it describes exactly how to do it. Generally speaking, what you're doing when you're looking at these numbers, it's going to be a percentage. And it's going to be a negative percentage. Because it's going to, that's the way it, the formula is written. So on a spec sheet, if it says negative 0.458% per degree C, then you're going to want to enter into here negative 0.458. So not percent sign. Don't put the percent sign in there because that will make it wrong. Um, looking for a clear way to make less chance of a mistake here, but um, this, is why you send, this is why you're sitting through the webinar to learn how not to make the mistake. Read this sentence before entering that, that number. Be very careful to, to not forget the, the, the minus sign and to not put the percent sign. Should be simpler, it's not right now. Quite often, the VOC temp coefficient and VMP are going to be the same. In this particular module, they're different. I've got P 0.39, negative 0.39 for my VMP, and I've got negative 0.29 for my, my VOC. So in this case here is different. So those are going to enter in, and you're using that for string sizing. Um, and we're using the wattage of the panel for array sizing, or for, um, for module, for how many strings per, um, per, per charge controller. So, if we go further down here, now again, here's a section where we're going to need to know some Outback equipment. Currently, we have two flavors of our charge controller, the FM80 and the FM60. They're both 150 volts open circuit maximum, so there's your maximum voltage. The 60 has a maximum output current of 60. Um, the 80 has a maximum output current of 80. So, if you happen to be using a competitor um, in, uh, charge controller, you can put the number in for them too. Um, but remember, I won't be speaking on our network, but I mean, uh, if you, you can use it for that. But this is where you enter in the maximum current output of the controller and the maximum voltage input. I know somebody's out there saying, what about the new medium voltage charge controller? That's coming. I don't know when. Um, uh, hopefully soon, and it'll be higher voltage. That's all you get today. So you enter those in, it's going to give, help us decide how many charge controllers we need. Batteries, this one you want to watch, watch what the results are. Matter of fact, I'm going to go back and forth and show you the results um, in a second here after we get through the finish, finish the input. So basically at this point I've selected a battery that's 1600 amp hours at 2 volts. With a with a round trip of, with a battery efficiency of 90%, it happens to be our RE1600 battery, and I'm going to show you how I came up with that decision here in a second by entering in a different battery. But this is for a specific type of battery with a specific voltage cell of two, four, or no, two, four, two, six, twelve, or twenty-four. There are some four volt cells out there, and there are some eight volt cells, but right now that doesn't do it. I would like to see that changed. <laughs> I, just, I just caught that. So, next section down is the inverter, or the generator, I'm sorry. So again, this is going to help us decide how many of the, of the batteries we chose. Next section down is our generator. So we're going to want to put in here the charging amps of the inverter. We're going to want to put, from this spec sheet, we're going to want to put in the battery charger efficiency. We're going to want to put, and which is 85% for almost every battery-based inverter on the market today. So I know that number is low, and that's because all inverter manufacturers tweak their inverters for the inverter side, not for the charger side, which is also an argument against AC coupling, but that's for a different day. Uh, battery power charge factor. Well, I'm actually, our charges are our power factor corrected, so we'll leave that at 100. Um, AC load power factor, we'll leave that at 98%. Um, this, you're getting pretty specific here, um, and that's for, because you're, it's going to help, it's going to, uh, what it's going to do is help size the generator, all this information is. 
Altitude D rate is going to just basically increase the size of the generator if you go down. And then you have the battery bulk charge set points, which is going to determine the wattage at the given um, maximum uh, charge rate of the inverter. So it's going to help us decide the wattage of the generator. And then, yes or no, do we want to allow battery charging from the generator or do we just want the generator there for running loads? You can select yes or no there. And I have yes selected. So now that we have all these filled out, now there's going to be more input. I mean, I didn't change anything, so I just hit, didn't show you the stuff earlier. But we're going to get this next section down, system sizing. So what we have here now is it comes up and it tells us that using that particular battery, that 1600 amp hour battery, that two volt cell, we're going to need 24 of those batteries per string to make our 48 volts because we selected 48 volts and we're going to need 1.9 strings of batteries, which of course, fairly straightforward on the rounding there, we're going to go to two strings. The thing I want to point out here, and this is probably deeper than we need to go into system design, but frequently I'll get the spreadsheet back from customers who want me to look at it and they'll say, well, I have my system in, I selected your 200 RE battery because I really like how easy it is to connect that. It's a 12 volt battery. And if I use that particular battery and I come back to the system summary, it's going to say I need four batteries per string, 15 and a half parallel strings of battery. For those of you out there who have done battery based systems, you know how wrong that is. You don't want to have any more than three parallel strings. I'm not going to get into the whys of that right now, but call your battery manufacturer. If it's us, call us. Um, and you'll notice by doing that, it's really this tells you you've chosen the wrong battery. So what I'm going to want to do is find a battery that's more in line with the number that I see up at the top, which was 3000 amp hour battery bank, right? So I went down through the spec sheets, through my sales literature, I found a 1600 amp hour battery and I changed it to that. And since I changed it to a 1600 amp hour battery, I also changed it to a six volt or two volt cell. So I'll point that out right now. So this is one of the things that's useful about a program like this, or not a program, but a spreadsheet like this. So now we know that we want 24 batteries in parallel, two parallel strings of batteries. Next section down on inverters, we're not doing really any D-rate, we have that here. And I've selected an 8K radiate, 8K inverter with a 16 kVA surge. I selected that off of, you know, literature. And I know that means one inverter to support the continuous loads and also one inverter support the, the surge loads. So I can get by with one radian in this case. Down to the PV array, what it would tell you here if you had a different module, it's the minimum number of modules per string, per series string, and the maximum number per series string. Most of the time, with what I would call grid tie modules, these modules that are in somewhere in the 40 volt open circuit range, you end up with a minimum and maximum of three. So it's pretty straightforward. You want to select three. These blue boxes are what you're going to select. If I was to select four, it's going to give me a warning because I'm going to get a high voltage and damage the controller potentially. So I want to make that within the window. So now three modules in series, it's going to take 17 strings to achieve the number that I'm going to put in the number. I actually already did this. This, this, this is the number that it gives you. And then this is the number that you choose. So in other words, if you have a rounding, let's say this says 17.5 strings, then you could choose either 17 or 18 and then see the results. And the results are your, what you put in here is going to be, the, the blue box, so I'm choosing 17, tells us the total array wattage, how many watt modules per string, and 17 parallel strings. With that, I'm going to need four of our 80 amp charge controllers and a 13 kVA generator. So, by entering in all that data correctly, we got a pretty good summary there. So, I did that pretty close. We've got five minutes left. I've gotten through it. I'm going to open my question pane and I'm going to put up on the board here my final slide as well because one of the questions inevitably is going to be how do I get this beautiful incredible thing and the truth is I don't believe it's on the website right now so 
you will send, if you'd like this, an email. I didn't put my personal email on there because I didn't want to get flooded. I want to, I, I'm assisting help on this. But it says to the training at outbackpower.com. And also, to beat the question to the to beat to the question of the punch, I'm also sending at the same time, whether you want it or not, <laughs> a PDF of the slides we just went through too, which were not very much, but somebody asked for it last time. So it's easier to send it to everybody than nobody, than one or two. So questions. Okay. How do we determine for a pump, search for a pump, if it's larger? Good question. As a rule, there's a couple of rules of thumbs you can use, and there's actually the accurate way. One of the rules of thumb is with an FX inverter from us, one of our FXR inverters, whatever size it is, doesn't matter. The rule of thumb is three-quarter horsepower per inverter. So if I've got two FXRs, I could go about a horse and a half. The radian is exactly twice what the FXR is. So in that case, I would basically say that for each radian, 1.5 horsepower. That's the rule of thumb. The absolute correct way to do it would be to look on the pump and get what the lapped rotor amp rating is of that pump and multiply it by the voltage. And it's going to be an extraordinarily high number. Um, what you asked is one of the most relevant questions that can be asked of a, of a battery based inverter sizing um, situation and one of the hardest to answer. Um, I turned off my email. Okay. Um, so, so basically, let's say that you have a two horsepower motor that you're trying to start and you're using a radian. Technically, that's beyond what we say it's possible. If you look at the numbers, it's probably going to say no. So, should you try it? If it's convenient, yes. One option you have would have there, for instance, with a two horsepower with a radian would be to try it. Tell your customer up front, based on the math, this may or may not work. And you've got a lot of other loads, and you may need to go to two. If you do exceed the capacity of the inverter, it will go over current and not damage the inverter. Um, you know, it's easy for us to say, well, just upsize one inverter, but that's costly. So if you're starting to get specific, that's one where I might talk to tech support. You know, if you're getting a specific number. Um, yeah, good question. I already have the tool. How do I update it? That one's the easy one. Delete the old one. <laughs> it's just a spreadsheet. Um, so um, I don't know what version you have, but there's been a few bugs here and there, and they will continue to be. Um, and I, I, I'm assuming that very soon we'll have it on the web as well. I think we should put it there somewhere very easy to get to. For right now, I'll just send you the new version. Um, so like at the end, you know, afterwards, you can send an email to training and Outback Power and request it, and you'll, yeah, and you'll get the new one. So yeah, there's no update as such. Any other questions? OK. Well, we ended with one minute to spare. I'm pretty good with time management or something. So thank you very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Um, you know, if you have really a lot deeper questions, I'm going to really, I'm going to plug my, I'm going to plug the uh, CTP again, certificate training program. It's intended really for installers, um, but I, I, I welcome homeowners as well. Um, it's four days. It's intense. Um, I do everything in my power to make it worth your worth your money and and, and effort. Um, this stuff is not simple. Thankfully, or else I wouldn't have a job. With that, thank you much. Have a great day.